Well, that was unpleasant. <laughs> they uh, changed all the positions and how to go about things to get us finalized and connected. So it looks like we are connected, near as I can tell. Uh, I showed that we're live, and as soon as we have uh, ground control in place, let me know that we are cooking, then we will uh, go ahead. Aha, Erica is here, and we did get one of your questions in online. Andrea is here. And uh, good to have you folks here. Sorry for the late delay. Again, it was a technical problem. And as soon as I fired up the uh, software, boom, everything was in a different location, and there was no button for doing a live broadcast. They had buried it to several levels deep into another uh, system. So they're trying to improve things, and that didn't improve our response time over here. Roberto, welcome. So, yeah, let me know uh, once we are connected. Yeah, Calcedon Foundation is ready. So, it is June 23rd, 2018, and this is Calcedon q and I'm Martin Cerbretti, the Vice President of the Calcedon Foundation, and here we get into questions that are submitted online, and then we go to the live questions. Sometimes we have maybe one or two uh, submitted questions and can get right into the live questions. Today, we have quite a few <laughs> uh, questions that came in online, uh, most of them uh, toward the end of the week. So uh, we have a couple of things to clean up from last week. One was the question from Luke 12, 33, where Jesus uh, says, you know, go ahead and sell what you have and give to the poor, give to alms, and uh, you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, we want to resume that. Uh, Mark touched on it, and uh, Ground Control put the link in from the series that Mark is doing uh, that focuses on the book of Luke. Also, it would be interesting to note that uh, that verse was used to justify works salvation at one time. <coughs> it was thought all you had to do was sell what you have, give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven, as if that's instant salvation guaranteed to you. <clears throat> and that's not the case, because the preceding verse says, it pleased the Father and gives him pleasure to give you already the kingdom of heaven. So the people there are not being justified to get into it. They are already members of the kingdom of heaven, and consequently, they are to themselves give. God has given them uh, the kingdom of heaven. They, therefore, in turn, are to give to the poor. So it is not a justification for work salvation in any stretch of the imagination. And as several commentators point out, if really they were meant, were meant to uh, sell everything they had, that would be pretty, pretty... That would mean that the church would then be a burden on everybody, <laughs> as opposed to being a light on the hill. So it is um, important to get all these categories down straight. Another point to be had, and we mentioned this last week, is that the direction was given to the disciples. Now, they uh, needed to become evangelists. Jesus is trying to create tw a dozen evangelists who are going to go out and preach the kingdom of God. And if they have ties back to the home then the focus in the heart's going to be there, and not on the kingdom of God, uh, focusing on its propagation, its extension. So these are all important factors that come into play in this question. So I think that uh, helps us gain context. When it's taken out of context, we have a problem. For example, in respect to context, earlier in Luke, just a few verses before, is a story about the rich fool who all he worried about was getting material goods on earth. And, of course, that made him a fool. He had no treasures in heaven. And the idea of giving alms to the poor is that this is moth-proof, burglar-proof uh, treasure. You know, nothing can impact it and hurt it. Then we had a, a question last week that we said we would defer to this week, which came from Shelby Shepherd. Is it feasible that rape is primarily a Sixth Commandment violation rather than a Seventh Commandment violation? I'll give you a verse to support this idea. And she's quoting from Deuteronomy 22. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her... Then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. And uh, Shelby continues, The section I emphasized in verse 26 is the part that I think categorizes it as a sixth commandment violation rather than a seventh commandment one. The reason why a betrothed woman is highlighted in this specific passage is to show that this rape Situation should it might be treated like adultery primarily, but that the woman is the victim of violence primarily. And fundamentally, that actually is the case. Uh, the law against adultery is to dissuade our lusts. Uh, um, and there you have the consensual notion in an adultery where both parties are consenting to violate God's law. In the case of the rape, it is a forceful thing. And therefore, the clause that Shelby is emphasizing is significant. 
uh, one of the commentators from Lange's uh, era uh, pointed out that, that, in fact, it was a murderous intent behind the rape. Now, all rape, in fact, has murderous intent because it is exacted by force. And just like it takes force to kill a person, or, or for that matter, also some cunning, uh, if poison would do the same thing, but it has a separate law for that, so force is used to um, kill the virginity or attempt to kill the virginity of, uh, of the betrothed woman who is promised to someone else entirely. Uh, oh, today's the 24th? Well, then we're going to have to fix some of our... Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if I can fix that or not, Control, but you, you have me there. Hey, today's June 24th. Everywhere in the globe, except on the other side of the dateline. So, yeah, I would agree that this indicative and this phrase is unique. He says it really is comparable to the situation of a murder because of the forcefulness of it. And that's why the verb force, the man force the betrothed woman uh, in the field where she can't be uh, saved. The damsel cries out and there's none to help to save her from the violence. And it is a salvation from violence, like there's none to save from uh, murderous violence, so to ra ra rapine uh, um, is also something to be saved from. So the point is well taken that you can even defend from Scripture, from this verse, that rape is primarily an act of violence and therefore should be aggregated under uh, a, the murder statute because the very verse says it is like unto it. The verse says, for as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. When you have the, the idea, for as, even so, or just as, even so, this is an equation. It's showing that there is an equipollent. There's a uh, something about the two cases which is very, very similar that draws attention, and God himself is drawing attention to that in this case. So that's a very observant point. Next question. Is it a man-centered thing to classify some aspects of God's law minor? Yes, because men want to say, you know, Rashtun Yagi is like that passage in Proverbs about the woman who sins and then she uh, takes a napkin and dabs the corner of her mouth like it was just a little thing uh, and therefore a, a trifle not to be worried about. And this is man's basic thing is to de-emphasize and to trivialize sin at all points. Uh, but rather, <clears throat> as we will find out in the last uh, question we're going to answer, which relates to 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six, the... Um, the power of uh, sin is the law, and the sting of uh, sin is is death. And it all, and because the law represents the will of God, there is no escaping death by violation of any uh, law of God. No matter how minor, the uh, curse of death is now, and the victory of death over us is uh, in place. So it just takes. And that's why James says, if you uh, break. Uh, any one of the laws, you're guilty of the whole thing because the curse of the law is now operative. So we like to play games because it suits our sin nature to try to justify ourselves. Uh, and that's why it is essentially a very humanistic thing to do. And it's also egocentric because we always think in terms of man and how the law of God affects man, usually adversely when in fact it's a blessing to us. You know, read Psalm 1, in fact, is a point of confusion. Uh, and in this instance, <clears throat> uh, man-centered because it's not God-centered. Uh, it's certainly not earth-centered or anything else, because we're talking about sin, and we're talking about classifying sins. And by classifying them, we are trying to say, well, at least I am not like this guy. Like the two men who were praying, and the uh, Pharisee says, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like this publican next to me who's beating his breast saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the publican went away justified and not the Pharisee. Because, again, the Pharisee was man-centered. I'm comparing myself to this publican, and the publican is comparing himself to God's law. I'm a sinner. So different orientations, one theocentric, one egocentric. Then I think this came in from Diane Williamson. It actually came in live, but I didn't happen to see it in the feed last week. Very often people, even some Christians, will state that anyone who commits murder has to be possessed by Satan. This has been declared in light of recent school shootings and also just everyday crime. Jeremiah 17.9 proclaims the human heart to be wicked, and actually I'd more wicked than anything else, above all things who can know it. I thought a person was capable of murder without any assistance from Satan. Please advise. And Diane is completely correct. Uh, men don't need any help to become murderers. Uh, murderous thoughts proceed from the heart. Uh, James makes it very clear. It's not that Satan entices us to murder. Uh, it's rather that we want to murder. Uh, 
and th that murderous impulse in us is not set at bay until Christ transforms us. Uh, and so we take a murderous Paul, Saul, if you will, and turn him into evangelist Paul, apostle Paul. Uh, so a transformation from every uh, thing that's in our heart is important. So correct, I mentioned, I think, last week that uh, Satan isn't the most evil thing or wicked thing in the, out there that's created. Rather, it's the human heart is more wicked and deceitful than anything who can know it. And certainly the writer of that book was more aware who Satan was. Satan's function is more as an adversary. In fact, that's pretty much what the term means. Uh, he's an enemy and an adversary. Uh, but so, sometimes it doesn't suit him to murder. Sometimes it suits him. Whatever law causes God's law to be laid aside is a good thing from his point of view. But because it's lawless, that's uh, the intention. So why is it that uh, people want to say there must be a reason, uh, some external reason why a uh, murderer took place, why a school shooting took place, and why that had to have been satanically inspired or demonic or what have you? It's because they're un they are so convinced in the goodness of man that there must be some external agent. So generally it means that there's a deprecation of the notion of total depravity, that men, there's the sin nature in man shapes everything that we do, that we operate in terms of Genesis 3, 5, determining for ourselves what is good and evil, being our own source of law. And therefore, under that premise, uh, a murderer is, is fine, because under my uh, ethical code, my moral code, uh, I'm offer numero uno, says the sinner, and uh, if I need to murder to protect myself uh, or my reputation or my, some money that I stashed over here or some drugs I put over there, or because I just don't like, uh, I want to live anymore, I have a murderous impulse, then that's what's going to happen. So, very much the case that we don't need Satan to have murders. Uh, now, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. We uh, um, get this doctrine, I think it's in John eight forty four, a liar and a murderer from the beginning, a deceiver. So, certainly that makes us mm, of a feather, with his nature, but we are self-motivated and self-energized in respect to the murders that we do. We were talking about the cities of refuge last week, and Ground Control put up the link to Dr. Rushton's discussion of that, which is from Deuteronomy. Uh, if I said Leviticus like last week, I apologize. In my head, I had one thing, and my mouth had a different idea what word to throw out there. And the question was, might we be correct in viewing California as a humanistic city of refuge? And now the emphasis here would be humanistic. Under humanism, we want to shield people from all sorts of things, uh, especially uh, environmental concerns um, and certainly the God and heavens with whom we have to do. He's a liability from the standpoint of humanism. So anything that can shield us from God or from uh, anything that judges man or puts man in a bad light or, or cramps man style, that's valid. And so we do have the notion that under uh, uh, current humanistic law, uh, you can have a humanistic city of refuge. Now, the question is, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And then, and then I wonder, what ethical um, standard do we make that decision? Under a biblical standard or the humanistic standard? But it must be acknowledged that virtually everything in Scripture, you can find a humanistic false counterpart that shares some things in common with the scriptural archetype, the original form, but in the uh, humanistic form it's bent and corrupted in some way, shape, or form for some other purpose entirely. So it might actually uh, have good intentions in some respects, but not achieve them in a biblical way. So yes, uh, this tells us really that the work of the law is in men's hearts. And so we instinctively say there should be something like this. Rushton, he talks about the doctrine of the ombudsman. Ombudsman, he says, is an idea that is actually anchored in the doctrine of the cities of refuge. However, the ombudsman, the entire premise is humanistic, and so the results are humanistic and not biblical. Even though the intentions are, in essence, good to create a, a, a pressure valve, a relief, an appeal system, so that the um, government that you have is not at the apex of authority that is uh, totally incapable of appeal. In other words, it speaks as a god. With an ombudsman, you have the choice of saying, I'm going to go to the ombudsman, and he's going to intervene and intercede, or she could be a woman ombudsman. There's no distinction uh, in the principle of it. And then that is your court of appeal to say, I have not received justice at the hands of the government. 
and the ombudsman in principle can then intervene and intercede. But it would not be intervening or interceding on biblical grounds, but rather on humanistic grounds, which may or may not match the biblical criteria for a legitimate uh, appeal against uh, justice. Uh, for example, if a legitimate murder was going to be uh, executed legitimately under biblical law, theoretically they can go to the ombudsman and say, I want to... Um, I want a stay of execution, I want to be released, I want a pardon or what have you. And the ombudsman could be um, what they call the bleeding heart and decide that they're going to show mercy where the Bible says they're not to show mercy and intercede. So all these things can come into play because humanism and sin complicates everything. So even when we have the shadow of a biblical idea present in our culture, like the ombudsman notion, uh, it is distorted enough that you don't get justice, even if that's the intent of it, because the premise of it is humanistic law, and therefore it's shifting sand. Um, Bill Evans asked a thing that I think is suitable to ask. Are the terms sojourner, stranger, alien used synonymously in the law, or do the terms have distinctive references? My understanding is that they fundamentally refer to the same category of thing. They're essentially uh, synonymous in their treatment, and it would be, I think, disreputable to say, uh, I'm going to make these distinctions, and therefore this law says I, can, I have to do this for a sojourner, therefore I don't have to do it to someone I consider an alien or a stranger, uh, etc., etc. Uh, I think Jesus cuts that all apart when, he, when the question is, who's my neighbor, comes up, and he poses it and answers it with a parable of the Good Samaritan, and therefore he says all these distinctions should, should drop because uh, the person who behaves properly showed mercy to the man in the ditch was the neighbor, and that means go and do likewise. So uh, all these laws are to make sure that the respect of persons is not observed in our legal system and that mercy flows where it's appropriate to flow to. Let's see. Nancy Wilk asks an interesting question. I found it interesting. There's discussion in our country about approving a zoning request, maybe a county. There's a discussion in our county about approving a zoning request that would permit an Islamic cemetery. The Islamic custom requires the body to be in contact with the earth. The point of objection is concern for how the decaying body will affect their well water. What is the biblical requirements for burial in general, and what are the provisions for those outside the Christian faith? Please also discuss any current customs associated with death and burial that may be contrary to biblical practice, for example, embalming, cremation, organ donation, etc. I'm not probably going to get so much into the other uh, without going into the first and letting that other part hang. Uh, Mark Rushton has done some interesting discussions on the, the, why burial is the preferred mechanism, and you'll find uh, burial uh, referenced many, many times throughout Scripture. Burying place in the King James is preferred to the word burial, which is relatively infrequently used, but it is there, burial. Uh, once in Ecclesiastes 6.3, which makes a comment that to not be buried is to better, better, better have been untimely born than not to have... Uh, uh, receive one of two blessings, one of which was to be have the body buried. And to not have the body buried was uh, considered uh, a, a curse and an indignity visited upon a body. Now, uh, let me grab my Bible here. In Ecclesiastes, there's an important verse here concerning what happens at death. Right, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This happens uh, when a man dies. It, verse 6, The silver cord be loosed, golden pole be broken, the pitcher be broken, the fountain and the wheel broken at the cistern. These all indicate the dissolution of the body. And then the dust returns to the earth, and then the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. As contrasted with the passage in the third chapter, of Ecclesiastes, which says the spirit of man goes up to God and the spirit of a beast goes down to the earth, along, along with the body of the beast. But in each case, we, this, here we see the biblical picture is of the body returning to the earth where it came from. So, in essence, that is not necessarily a wrong thing to, to have the body in contact with the earth uh, from the Islamic point of view. In fact, one could argue it's, 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 it's intrinsically scriptural, if you can say by accident or by appropriation, but nonetheless, there it is. So the artifice would be to have the big uh, structures that preserve uh, the body almost indefinitely, you know, pyramids and gigantic tombs. And these are actually mentioned in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, uh, Babylon is informed, you know, the other kings, they're going to have, they sleep in these mighty glorious houses. In other words, the, the corpses are ensconced 
you know, mighty edifice that it, it draws attention. Wow, look at that tomb. And you have some pretty massive tombs protected by thousands and thousands of uh, soldiers um, in, uh, in China made out of uh, terracotta uh, to protect the tomb and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the trappings of wealth in those and power uh, accrued to the, the death industry of these uh, cultures. So that's kind of the extraordinary thing. And the Babylonians informed you're not going to have that benefit uh, for, for, you, for your sins. Uh, it's not going to be like the other kings of the earth. Uh, so uh, bottom line is it's not intrinsically wrong. Now, uh, the burial of a leper even is referenced in Scripture that they will be buried with their fathers. Uh, it's in one of the um, history books, and consequently, the fact that there's a disease in the skin that would theoretically pass through Hansen's disease into the soil is is not acknowledged as a problem from the scriptural point of view, and I don't see any reference to it in the Journal for Biblical Ethics up there on my shelf. So uh, if the Bible says it's okay, then, of course, we, we have to say God knows best. The entire um, groundwater system is designed to purify. What it doesn't purify very well, <laughs> uh, obviously, are um, some of these chemicals that persist deep, deep down, and then they end up back in our bloodstream because we we're drinking water that uh, the God did not purify because we're polluting in a certain way with a particularly invidious chemical that is not given to um, a breakdown biodegradation. Uh, so the upshot is, uh, I think that there might be more anti-Muslim sentiment in fighting the ordinance than there is true concern about groundwater. Uh, we certainly have not suffered unduly from all the cemeteries that are out there because very, very few coffins don't uh, degrade. And the emphasis nowadays is even on uh, biodegradable coffins, the pine casket. Uh, again, even these are a form of artifice. The advantage that they give, interestingly enough, is forensic. It's much easier to go back and say, hey, was this a murder? If the body's intact enough to be able to analyze it and say, oh, there's arsenic in the hair, or there's something like that. So exhumation, the process of uh, doing some analysis to see if someone actually did not die a natural death, as might have been asserted on a death certificate by some uh, coroner or medical examiner who's on the take, uh, pulling the body out and having another look at it might reveal all sorts of hidden sins that supposedly were buried but are not. Um, so uh, that's almost an accidental benefit, if you will, of the coffins. But those are, uh, apart from the very, very rich <laughs> and the mausoleums and things like that, they're, they're relatively new. Most of the saints in Christendom have gone straight down into the ground and in some cases with lime to help accelerate the decay of the body. Um, but all this to say... The principle that is laid out here is that they go to sleep. And uh, it's laid out, I think, in Isaiah. It said, uh, the righteous, they shall sleep upon their beds, uh, and uh, they shall rejoice. And uh, the way it is praised, it praised in Revelation 14, their work shall follow them. So, um, but that's in the, under the picture of a sleep, and therefore not of being turned into dust, per se, except that they return to the dust. Nonetheless, the metaphor of sleep is still valid. There's a lot of uh, friction over and above this that can be discussed because uh, folks want to be, quote, efficient. Oh, I want myself to be cremated. I don't want to have to you know, consume any ground uh, with uh, my grave. Well, you can always go vertical, <laughs> as the saying goes. So there's, there's no reason why you have to do, do a cremation. And But we get a lot of emotion in here as well, and notions that uh, to be um, have the body burned was considered a curse. For, of course, God can um, has no trouble assembling uh, the uh, on the day of resurrection all the bodies back together again because it is it is not impossible for God to do that. Uh, the question is, what is our attitude toward the body? And if we are dualist, if we think you know the body is a cursed thing, and we're Manichaean, then we also say, well, the spirit is much more important than the body, and consequently, the body we can treat it with contempt. In fact, it's a mark of faith to treat it with contempt because it means that we're not body or materialistic, we're spiritual. But the reality is that our spirituality is uh, determined by our approach to all things, including the body. It's kind of a testing ground for character in all respects. So, okay, we are just actually went to two pages. I had to print out two pages for our questions. Erika Schanzenbach asks, 
How should Christians manage personal expectations in regard to God's many promises of blessings for faithfulness? Are his promises for physical blessing, for example, prosperity, children, health, long life, meant to be understood in a national sense only? Or should our expectations of experiencing these blessings hinge on the faithfulness of the nation and not just ourselves? Do we understand them as general principles which don't necessarily extend to every person? Should we expect to experience some of these blessings but not all of them? How do we believe God's promises without falling into a name-it-and-claim-it mentality or spiritualizing the promises into virtual non-existence? So what we have here is a tension, saying here's some promises of God, and yet we don't see them all um, realized. Some t- seem to be tied to the nation at large. Some be, uh, looks like God is sovereign over the circumstances. I've did everything that God expected me to do, and yet, boom, I'm... I'm um, lacking something, or because if uh, if it's a mechan- mechanistic, um, you know, you, these things happen, and boom, magically the result should happen, and it doesn't, it is God at fault? So certainly, God did not um, leave Job a lot of reason to trust God's promises, but yet Job says, though He uh, slay me, yet will I trust Him. So the, I think the first attitude going in is, regardless of what you see. Do not walk by sight, walk by faith. And he was in a, if, had he, if he was walking by sight, he would have had been in a world of hurt. Certainly his three buddies were walking by sight. <laughs> and so they were feeding him everything that you needed to know as a sight walker. And he stuck to his guns and said, I don't know, there's something wrong here. And uh, I, I want to talk, talk to God face to face to see why this is happening to me. Uh, so he protested. Uh, and that's an interesting thing so far as it goes. Now, let's take a look at Israel during the early part of its um, sojourn in Goshen, the province of Goshen, uh, when the first plagues were coming through to, on Egypt. Notice that several of them, for the first batch, uh, Israel shared the exact same fate as Egypt. The all Egyptian and Israeli shared the same fate. The curse hit them both. Then there came a time when God made a difference. Now, there was no difference in Israel's conduct at that point in time. Israel did nothing to deserve the lifting any more than it deserved to be sharing Egyptians' uh, discomfort with the first curses, the first plagues. But there came a time when God made a difference, and at the border of Goshen, the plague stopped. The Egyptians suffered from it, but Boom, there wasn't any such effect on Israel. They didn't share the curses of their host nation, which had enslaved them. So, in other words, sovereignty is always operational. You need to realize that God is sovereign, and, of course, uh, pretty much everyone on this uh, Q&A session is aware of that fact, and that means he's sovereign over the distribution of blessings. And whether he gives them to us on this side of the grave, on the other side of the grave, it doesn't matter, uh, shouldn't matter to us. Because we know God has his purposes for these things. He directs everything the way he wants. And remember, uh, it takes a lot of character to handle prosperity. Prosperity tends to be a curse to us because we mishandle it so badly. We draw the wrong conclusions from it. Uh, We become complacent and we sit on our lees. And next thing you know, we want to go back to Egypt, using that metaphor again. Obviously, I agree with Erica that the name it and claim it mentality is a very dangerous position because it really is calling upon God uh, to uh, perform for us on our demand. It's not a matter of simply praying God's promises back to him, which I believe is appropriate to do. You know, and that's the only real problem thing that makes sense, is to say, Lord, see the, um, you know, how long... This is exactly what's going on in Revelation 6, 9, 10, 11. Uh, chap- chapter 6, verses 9, 10, 11. The saints underneath the altar in heaven, how long, O Lord, before you uh, avenge us of uh, our enemies? Uh, so there's a sense in which we, they are aware that God will exact justice. He is just, and everything he does is right. Uh, there's no shadow of turning in him. Nonetheless, his timing does not match human timing. He operates on scales much longer than we do. Consequently, we become frustrated and impatient. Um, there's a beautiful uh, message by Rush Duni, uh, called Patience, which we are going to be uh, posting very, very shortly. A, uh, Asked Kyle Shepard to dig it up, and he sent it to me, and I'm going to bring it, send it up to the uh, uh, Kyle Stephen offices for publication. But it's a very, very powerful thing, because patience is something that God has. 
and it's something that we lack and it's something that we need and when we don't have it uh, we often are forced into uh, sinful situations because we lack it um, certainly Saul we mentioned this last week was very very impatient and get very nervous when Samuel didn't show up to bless the troops and offer the sacrifice so he decided well I got to take things into my own hands and impatience was the end of his reign that was the beginning of the end from that we had get on to the question of which of Endor and things like that. So, Nathan Conkey had two questions, and then we'll have Roger Oliver's, then we go to the live ones. You are starting an agricultural enterprise raising fowl for eggs and meat and perhaps some vegetables. What are some of the several laws you must consider in order to honor God in this enterprise and be blessed in it? Well, I think you have to have regard to thy beast. This is laid out, of course, in the Proverbs. Um, the righteous man hath regard unto his beast, and so therefore you need to see them from that light, and uh, uh, that that's, that that I think is the key to it. And then, of course, the tithing of the proceeds, so that God is honored in that aspect, also important. Uh, whatever shape and form that might take, uh, is to be important. And I think the rest God uh, teaches us um, to use wisdom. That's why I'm so impressed with the juxtaposition of these two verses, the one verse in, I think it's Proverbs 21.4, uh, that even though plowing of the wicked is sin, so here we see a, a supposedly neutral enterprise like plowing can be sinful, and then the second half of Isaiah 28 explains how a righteous man plows and works his field. And so we can see that there's, and it says, and it says God teaches him these things. Uh, that the things are to be the right, done in the right order, with the right tools at the right time. Uh, and then this causes the earth to yield her strength, uh, as opposed to the sinful man who's plowing. He might be plowing seven years in a row, which exactly is what was happening with Israel. So uh, always be mindful of the variations and, and the things that have to be done. And this, uh, in fact, I have a little experience with just such a poultry farm that was set up in uh, Jinja, Uganda, one of the first steps we made before uh, getting an orphanage up off the ground is to have a little income from such an enterprise. So, uh, all of value, and you have to look after the animals, and because they are the source, really, of uh, and the resource, the capital that you're working with, and so care of them because they are living capital must be uh, handled. Cannot be cruel to them. For those who say, well, God's indifferent to suffering of animals, Remember what happened when Balaam was riding on his donkey, in the, in the she-donkey, uh, tried to evade the angel in the way, and the angel informs Balaam when he reveals himself, he said, surely I would have killed you and saved her alive. Actually drew attention to the fact that the angel would take care of the animal to make sure it survived the encounter with Balaam, if Balaam kept insisting on going out to curse Israel. So, uh, And also I think, all the other aspects have to be there. If you are an unrighteous man um, and you slack the law of God, you're going to be in a position of those folks in Haggai, right? Where you looked for much and little came and you wondered why there was a hole in your purse and you wondered why the eggs weren't laying, why the, the animals weren't laying. And sometimes you have to look at yourself for the cause for that. That all of creation is covenantal in its orientation toward man. There's no unmediated relations. Everything's mediated by the law of God. And so the earth and the things in it respond properly to us when we are in line with God. Your second question. I have been English as a second language teacher for a while. I am not sure I have a clue what it means to be a Christian, Christian ESL teacher, apart from the fact of supporting the work of Dominion schools, being a competent and a masterful teacher. I know that helping a students gain dominion over their subject matter is important, but how does one get a clue as to whether it, what it means to be a truly Christian language teacher? Uh, now, at this point, I'm going to draw attention to um, and have Ground Control put up an article called Japan's Other Disaster, written by Dr. Shu Suzuki. And Dr. Suzuki wrote this, and he had a comment to make about translations, that in fact, Japanese Bible has very, very serious flaws. The translations of the Japanese Bibles are such that the uh, laws against uh, idolatry, in other words, against um, bowing down before an idol and, and worshiping it are phrased in such a way as to actually allow it. And therefore, the we lower the bar 
and we actually allow some level of idolatry in because the translation is so poor and creates a false impression of what God expects. So the way that is countered, and you read it in the article by Dr. Suzuki, which is a very gripping article because it starts with the premise of the um, earthquake and the Fukushima um, reactor disaster and the radiation leaks, etc. But then pointing out that Japan has a spiritual disaster that's much worse than the nuclear disaster that continues to face it to this day. Uh, that all this is part of the playing field there that the Japanese had to deal with is a bad translation in their tongue. So, uh, what Shu said in order to teach scripture properly, Dr. Suzuki, I call him Shu, uh, I had to train them in English so that they then can get a proper translation in a language where we had the benefit of it. So, from one point of view, being a Christian ESL uh, teacher, gives you a position to direct them to resources written in English that would not be uh, available necessarily in the language that they're in, which presumably is Spanish in this instance. I cannot speak to how authentic and powerful or whether there's any flaws uh, in the um, existing prevailing Spanish translations of Scripture. I know that uh, Roger Oliver probably would have some comments to make about this, and I think he might actually have done so. But the point is, we can get a better handle on things in some of the best English translations of the Bible, and therefore the Word of God is not being um, trimmed and rounded off, but rather given as the whole counsel of God that it is. And that in itself is a Christian ministry. So if we can give people that tool set to be able to appreciate the scriptures in a language that conveys their truth faithfully, potently, 100% without dilution, then we have done a Christian service. Uh, in the explicitly Christian service. Even then, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do with all your might, we're told. So even in a so-called secular uh, offering, when we are training in language, we should also be aware that language is used to obfuscate, which means to um, confuse, uh, to paper over, uh, to make unclear, which should be clear, <laughs> propaganda and things like that. And so uh, anytime we're operating in language, we're operating in a very delicate area, which is where the tool of communication is at stake. It's on the table. And uh, I actually think we've dealt with this on a couple of levels. Uh, the Strategy of Subversion is an article I wrote. It's probably online at Chalcedon. Uh, and uh, subversion starts with language. Orwell knew this and was concerned about this. And we have not uh, outgrown any of... Orwell's concerns, in fact, they tend to be compounded on good evidence that we are in bad shape with language and its subversion. And I'm sure many people who are listening to this Q&A can think of a dozen examples offhand just by applying, looking at the newspaper and saying, oh, that, that, that. yep, we're going to redefine all the words, starting with pronouns. Now, how many pronouns do we have? Quite a few, if some are to be believed. And they can be imposed by force of law. See, that's the problem, is that even in the area of language instruction, sometimes the government can come in and say, we want it taught this way, we want this, that, and the other, because they want a predetermined result. So every time uh, government comes in and tries to control language, uh, we know there's a problem, because that means the ability to communicate dissent from the government is going to be impacted by it. They will take away the terms and words used for criticism. They will also take away the words that would be used to express truth so that we end up with a political truth as opposed to actual absolute truth. And that's a dangerous place to be. Thank you. Yes, Japan's other disaster and the strategy of subversion. By the way, in, in literacy uh, and lit linguistics, I have an article, um, Worldview Contamination, uh, which deals with how worldview contaminates the linguistic enterprise, how languages uh, are directly attacked by humanism and used and shaped and formed to gain political ends. Uh, because that's your you know, narrative is everything in a post-humanist society. Because if you don't have narrative, you can't get all the crowds together with you. So, and narrative is simply another word for propaganda. Roger Oliver had uh, several questions uh, related to 1 Corinthians 15, two verses of it. Went with the funeral of a dear friend yesterday. The young man who delivered the devotion chose 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 and following. They're a dispensational group, 
reading through the passage, two points start out worthy of thinking about as a counter to the way most dispensationalists might interpret them. Verses 50 and 56. Verse 50 might give the impression that the kingdom is not now and or there are two kingdoms. The Net Bible, uh, note on the textual issue in verse 49, let us bear versus we shall bear, probably answers this one pretty well. The larger context also counters this idea, I think. And verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, seems to be ripe fruit for the antinomian. I read Rush's commentary you sent me on this passage. That is one side of the law, the sentence for disobedience, just looking for a concise and clear way to explain to my folks why this is not a statement against the law. Well, part of the problem, of course, is that it simply says that the uh, what is lifted is the, the, the uh, in this pull of passage of self up, the sting of death, kentron, is the word being used, 1 Corinthians 15, back a bit, bring it down. And we're starting with verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here in terms of the relationship of sin is that you, uh, no flesh is justified by works of the law. Consequently, uh, there is no victory through the law uh, for us. What has to happen is we need in the a in the propitiation and atonement, which then uh, absorbs the curse of the law and satisfies it. And so the law is satisfied and the curse no longer applicable. And if the curse of the law is broken by Christ, and that's exactly what he did by hanging on a tree, by being crucified, uh, he broke the curse uh, for all those who are his. And as a result, there is no um, sting. Death has no sting for the Christian. The second death has no power over them, is the way it is put in the book of Revelation. And so they rather are the children of the light, and uh, their work shall abide and follow them, and they shall have eternal life. And it's, an, it's a good kind of eternal life. So it's not antinomian, because the, the fact of the matter is that men still will die. Uh, if, if it was the fact that the law was gone, then of course you could argue from uh, Romans 5.12 that therefore... Hmm, it looks like, the, uh, in 5, 11, 12, that whole passage, that there should be no one dying at all. If the law has been set aside and is no longer operative, the power of uh, sin is the law, therefore sin should have no more power, and death shouldn't exist. Obviously death does exist in spades. It's pointed out for all men once to die, and then the judgment. So consequently the law is operative, and it finds strength, because the law is strong because it represents the will of God. And being the will of God, not just some words on paper, but the will of God himself, it is inexorable. It cannot be laid aside. It cannot be set aside. Rather, it has to be satisfied. And Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was the only one who could satisfy that law. And consequently, he took the curse upon himself and the sting of death. He became sin for us. And uh, that, that did not set aside the law at all, at all. It meant that he absorbed the consequences of it. So it's not truly an antinomian proof text. I think some opportunists might think, uh, if they didn't look at it too closely, I could sneak this one in and use it, but it's not. So, now, let's see, heading back to the top, if there were any questions pending. I saw a few comments. Looks like we have a lot, so let's see. A lot of folks in. Welcome, everyone. And it is the 24th. Again, I apologize. I was late too, Bill. We got fired up around 2, 2.07 because they changed everything. Is that because he was the... Uh, you're right. Uh, certainly, Satan was the first liar and uh, um, and uh, for murderer from the beginning and a deceiver. I already answered Bill's question. That one. I actually do not know... Um, how the Jews bury their, their dead. At that point, you're operating more in terms of um, traditions that have grown up in Judaism as opposed to something that you could directly say is st extracted straight out of the Pentateuch or some other passage of Scripture. Uh, so there you're going to see more um, traditions. And so far as a tradition does not violate the law of God, I don't think anyone has necessarily a problem with it. 
It's only when it's made mandatory as if God enforced it that we get a problem. And this is why the Jews were uh, running at odds with Christ in his day because they set this hedge up around the Torah and uh, therefore they were adding to the law of God in the name of trying to protect people uh, and the law of God from being broken. But that hedge meant that they were improving on the law of God and uh, their motives were, were wrong as a consequence. Correct, Roberto. God does have eternity on his side. In fact, he dwells in eternity. Uh, see, now, here's a question just sent in. Let me see if I can see it. And I can't see the whole thing. Rush Donnie spoke clearly against anarchy. Oh, right. How did that thing not get printed? I tacked it in here. I did print it. Rush Donnie spoke clearly against anarchy, yet many who identify and support the Reconstructionist movement seem to be advocating such on social media. Please comment on an apparent spirit of anarchy. And I seem to recall the rest of the question pretty good. Uh, let's see. First off, what Rushdoney promoted was Christian self-government. Now, let's not misunderstand that term. It doesn't mean the Christian governs himself and he has his own walking law code. Not true. Rather, the picture, and I have it in the book up there, uh, well, very, very well depicted Marshall Foster's um, The uh, American Covenant. It shows God with an arrow pointing down to a Bible, with an arrow pointing down to a pilgrim reading the Bible. Uh, and there I think I'll see the whole question. Thank you, ground control. So really, God is governing. So it is literally um, theocratic in the sense that God rules through his word and spirit to the individual man. And that man, therefore, is accountable upward to God first. But notice the word, God first because he's to have the preeminence in all things. But that doesn't mean that other people don't have eminence underneath that category. Uh, secondary governments, secondary causes, if you will, if you want to use a Calvinistic term. All those things come into play. And so, too, the Christian self-government is a form of government because that's where we start. And when Christian self-government applies, you don't need so much external government. But to the extent that Christian self-government languishes and you're not being governed by the Holy Spirit and by the law of God, uh, now, in order to avoid uh, total chaos and, and dystopia, the kind of things that you see in uh, popular Hollywood movies, which see the, the future as a very grim affair of doggy dog um, brutality, uh, to avoid that, boom, and then the state steps in and it does what God should have done or what, what we should have allowed God to do if we allowed to be, would be governed by him. But rather than being governed by God, we choose to be governed by tyrants. Uh, and that's our lot in life. Uh, if we repudiate God, then we get godlings, human gods in there, to then uh, give us our due. Uh, when you make that choice, you get the government that you deserve. So, uh, anarchy, in a sense, does not fly insofar as that God must rule. Uh, he is the true um, arbiter, if you will, of all things, and he rules through his word. So uh, that's why we can use the law of God and apply it. There's no need to be a legislator because God is our law giver, Isaiah 33:22, And uh, that is a critical verse so that we know where he, we stand with him. So uh, from one point of view, anarchy doesn't fly. On the other hand, I think what the anarchists, I think the Bible positions or supports the notion of minarchism, which is a very, very small, uh, almost infinitesimally small government. But that government is small because everyone is obeying God's law and our Christian sub government. And they, then you can observe, and, and, and all the parts of God's law, which are jots and tittles, are designed to flow together. And the, and the synthesis, the uh, bringing together of all these different disparate things, it creates uh, a righteous society where, where joy is the standard and where righteousness is and justice prevail. And people can, are under their own vine and fig tree and they can watch their grandchildren playing in the streets in peace. All these things are the blessings of Christian self-government, but they are not intrinsically the blessings of anarchy. Anarchy uh, opens the door to all sorts of things that would not be uh, valid insofar as it goes. So a very, very small amount of the, um, and it's what, half shekel of silver per male, 20 years and up older, that is given for civil government. Uh, 
And then we, and so it's a relatively small amount. And it's like 11,000 times smaller than what we spend for civil government today. So what has happened is that Christian self-government, which used to be king during the pilgrim era, uh, it shrunk. And as a result, the phys physical, the um, civil government grew by a factor of 11,000 over what God would have required. Uh, so we're spending all this money you know, on a very inefficient bureaucracy, uh, which is attempting to control all things to make a perfect society. And who's going to determine what perfect society is? Well, it's not reference to the law of God. That's for certain. <laughs> uh, it believes that the Constitution is um, a more important law that should trump the, no pun intended, the, the Bible. So uh, I don't think that it's a proper use of Dr. Rushdoony's work or any notion of Reconstruction to say we not want, now want to build on anarchistic principles. Think about it. What is an anarchistic principle? Uh, if it's a principle at all, then it would have some arc in it, some uh, authority, if you will. Uh, and therefore, it's almost like it's an oxymoron, an anarchistic principle. It really is the denial of principle, the denial of any kind of authority, uh, certainly any authority over you. But that doesn't mean that God does not put people authority over you. Uh, Jesus seemed to acknowledge this with the centurion who made the observation that, you know, I tell a man, go here, and he goes here, and I tell a man, do this, and he does this, and Jesus says, someone gets it. You know, so, that's, yes, and we don't do want to draw everyone's attention to the upcoming Book of the Month Club. Charles Roberts will be discussing a very important book by Rushton. It's a thin one, but don't misunderstand this, because just because it's not a big whopper tome doesn't mean it's unimportant. The thesis in the atheism of the early church is a very, very important one, and it's one that's with us even to this very day, and so it would be a very worthwhile Book of the Month Club to sign up for and dig into. If you should happen to miss it because you can't catch it uh, live, do uh, look up on the website within a week or so. Usually it's posted, and you can acquire it there again. Doug Baldwin writes, I find that there are those who, for whom I consider be co-belligerents, but not comrades, as it were. And I think that that's an important point. Co-belligerent means someone who is fighting that same battle, who you may not share all the other battles with um, and share common ground with. Jerry Falwell famously said, of the moral majority, he says, well, if we had all talked about theology, we'd have a bloodbath here. But they said, for the sake of working together, we are putting those differences aside. And you can see something very similar in Second Kings 3, when Jehoshaphat and, the, uh, and Ahab and uh, the other king, they come together uh, and to um, smite uh, and deal with uh, the uh, Syrians, I think it was. And uh, we actually talked about this a week or two ago. So, yeah, some, there's times when you can be co-belligerents. Now, even in the case that there was a co-belligerency there, I find it fascinating how uh, Elijah... Let's get the passage up. It was Elisha, in fact, but let's verify. Lest they say something wrong again. First Kings. Maybe the chapter wrong. Second Kings. Probably. You have to tell me how loud these page flips sound. So there it is. And Elisha, it was Elisha, uh, said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? So here's this notion of we're not comrades, right? <laughs> Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of my mother. And the king of Israel said, nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. In other words, we're in a world of hurt. We need your help. And Elisha then says, as the Lord of God liveth, which is an oath, as the Lord of God liveth, before whom I stand, surely, were it not for the presence that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. So he was indicating, yeah, we're going to, I'm co belligerents with you, I'm going to help you out, but we're not friends. You are an enemy of the faith. Nonetheless, because Jehoshaphat's here and we're working together for this cause, I'll throw in with you guys. Bring me a harpist 
and uh, I will prophesy once I've settled my spirit. And then he gives the instructions what they're going to do. And they uh, would have won the battle had not um, the fear of man prevail at the tail end. Rush Dooney has a fascinating discussion of this in the book, Chariots of Prophetic Fire, a fear of victory. It might have been the passage. But nonetheless, he does discuss it, and it's a very important one. So let's see what else we have for questions. Right. There's a North, Northern California Christian Reconstructionist Meetup, August 9th and 10th, hosted by St. Paul's Anglican Church. Details to follow. That's going to be fun for those in California. Right. And I think we have exhausted things, and we, are, we started about seven or eight minutes late, so I think we're going to go ahead, and if there are no more questions, do send your questions in to ask.calseed and calseed.edu. We just get them in advance, and then... Uh, as you can see, we try to get through them first. In this instance, it looked like it was a good thing since we only had about three or four follow-up questions. Uh, but they're all of importance, and they're all very key to us. Uh, Bill Evans, if you did not catch uh, last week's discussion, we spent some time on uh, issues related to uh, immigration that, and borders and things like that that might be of interest to you. Most people don't realize that uh, in Isaiah 19, there's a discussion about uh, Israel building, uh, rather Egypt building an altar at its border, and the highway between Egypt and Assyria. And it says, and the Assyrians shall come into the Egypt, and the Egyptians shall come into Assyria, and they shall serve God together. What is uh, so? You have basically a two-way open border there, press uh, in the future when both nations are Christianized. And that's two points to be made. They're doing it because they are all both Christianized. And two, it is a there's symmetry between the two sides of the border. Uh, you cannot have a situation where we have an open border from Mexico, but if you try to travel into Mexico, boom, you're stopped and the federales uh, take you in and say, okay, now what? So uh, if you're going to talk about applying the Bible to things like national borders, apply the Bible. And here, the Bible says, you know, the description there of an open border situation is it's an absolute two-way street, premised on, the, and the example is, of the enemies of God, having become, become for God's friends through conversion, the Assyrians and the Egyptians, they have a two-way street. But it's a two-way street, not a one-way street. So to use the example of a one-way street today, and say, here's the biblical case we can use to apply biblical rules of borders here, uh, seems to fly in the face. There seems to be something missing that has yet to be put in place, yet to be negotiated, and yet to be dealt with. So, all that to say, we should always argue for the whole of Scripture being applied, not just piecemeal, uh, or forgetfulness of key factors that need to be put into the mix to get the whole picture, and, uh, not, and to really literally be dealing with the whole counsel of God, and not just cherry-picking what we like for any kind of position, either pro or uh, con borders. Right, uh, The truth lies somewhere in between. The Bible is setting forth a standard that's going to prevail that looks more like open borders, but the details of it don't match what anyone has talking about today. So we need to get everything lined up to God's way because that's the way it's going to be because God says that's what's going to happen and we're going to be on the wrong side of history in the future if we contradict it. So, Again, glad everyone enjoyed it. Sorry for the late start. Now that we know the new uh, interface and where they're hiding the button to start a live event, a live broadcast, we won't suffer from that again next week. I look forward to seeing you, everyone, there. Uh, and continue to pray for and support Calcedon uh, so that we can continue to uh, work hard on behalf of the kingdom of God for you folks. God bless you all. Talk to you soon. Bye.